Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Bible Study, The Triumph of the Lamb, a study in Revelation. Today in the Sunday class, we finish our discussion on the New Jerusalem from Revelation chapter 21, verse 15 to 27. Let's listen in. Let's start with prayer and then we'll get going. Uh, Father, thank you for the study. We thank you for the book of Revelation. We ask you now, Lord, to guide us through this text and let your will be done in our conversation. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, uh, someone bring me up to speed. What have we seen then in Revelation 21? Since I don't remember. (laughs) Well, maybe we ought to start at verse 1. Let's verse 1, yeah. What are we what are we seeing here? What part of the book are we in? Good news or bad news stuff? Good news. Good news stuff. Good news stuff. And what is the good news? What are we what are we taking a look at here? Let me get more copy. The new heaven and new earth. The new heaven and the new earth. And what have we learned about the new heaven and new earth? What will not be there? The sea. What is that? Does it mean art doesn't ever get to surf? <laughs> Uh, sin won't be there. Not just sin, but what does it mean? Uh, what, what does what mean? That, that there's no C. No yeah, that sin won't be there, that's right. But what else? I mean, there's more to it than just that. Well, the separation from God is gone. Right? There's no more separation from God, right? These are excellent lemon bars, whoever is interested. Um. <laughs> Yeah, the sea is gone, which means... And and what else does it mean? The separation from God is removed. There's no more sin. There's no more disorder. One other thing that's kind of a theme throughout this book. All right. Mm -hmm. How does the sea function in the book of Revelation? What happens with it? That's where all the uh, evil things came. That's right. So there's no more even potential for evil things to come. Because from the place of disorder, that is now removed. And so that, that whole thing is gone. So in other words, to say the sea is gone does not mean there's no more bodies of water. There will probably still be surfing. You're, you're golden, all right. Um, but rather it's just saying that disorder, chaos, that fearful thing that no one can control, <clears throat> it will be removed, okay? Um, and that which separates us from God, because that's the other thing we saw in Revelation at the beginning, is there was a sea between John and and the throne, that separation is God. What? So then what's the counter side of that? If the separation from God is gone, what does this mean? Where is God? He's with us. With us. He's dwelling. <clears throat> dwelling in the midst of the people, right? All right. So uh, there's complete access, in other words, to God. He is our God, and we are his people, and he will dwell among us. Not in a hidden way anymore. Um, and then we see the Lamb and the Bride of the Lamb. And this is the church and Old and New Testament who is gathered together, adorned and beautiful, uh, prepared for her heavenly existence. Okay, and that's kind of where we stop then. Um, can someone read for us then 15 through 21, please? Ruth? <laughs> okay. Too late. <laughs> the angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was weighed, uh, laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. He measures its walls, and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement which the angel was using. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city wall were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the third sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, and the tenth crystal praise? I don't know. I have no idea what that is. Okay. The eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, 
each gate made of a single pearl. The great city of the great street of the city was of pure gold, like transparent glass. All right. So next week we'll do a quiz on who can uh, remember all of the jewels and pronounce them. That'll be the that'll be the trick there. Okay. So we have a very glorious picture here. Now we see an angel taking a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its walls. In the book of Ezekiel and in the book of Zechariah, both prophets have a vision of the the Jerusalem that the people of Israel are going to return to being rebuilt. And in their visions, the, the city's measured out with this with this uh, by this angel or whatever. In Ezekiel, he sees a man of bronze measure the new temple, um, and this serves as a think of it this way. If you're an Israelite and you're in exile, okay, and you fear you're never going back, and then God sends you a letter in the mail with the blueprints of the new temple, what is that going to say to you? It's reassurance. Yeah, it's reassuring. Sure. You're going back. It's almost yeah. like an invitation. Yeah, that's right. Like, don't worry, it's coming. Here's the measurements. I'm already planning for you to return. Uh, that's kind of the thrust of that in Ezekiel's vision is, look, you're, you are now in exile, but God is planning to bring you back. I even have seen the rebuilding of the temple uh, in a vision. In Zechariah, when he sees a man measuring the holy city, um, it's a reminder that God is going to be there in the midst of his people. It's, a, it's the promise of uh, the presence of God. That's what they see. So here then, John is seeing this angel do the same thing, probably for the same reasons. One, it's assuring uh, John and all of us of the concreteness of the new and restored Jerusalem, which will last forever and which will be God's holy dwelling place in the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, the, the way this reads is that, that there's going to be a whole earth renewed and there's going to be a section, and if you don't read it this way, go ahead and correct me because I might just be misunderstanding it. Uh, but that in the new heavens and the new earth, there is this section where God dwells. And we can come and go and see him sort of as we please. And we'll kind of see that throughout the text here. Um, and, and I don't know if I'm misreading that or not. And, and I'll find out. I'm sure I can ask someone at the seminary this week um, if I'm reading that correctly. But the idea here is God will dwell in, with his people and there will be a new heavens and a new earth and a new Jerusalem where God lives. So if you can uh, sort of, it's guaranteed, it's coming. This is the blueprints of Ezekiel. We see it promised to us, okay? So far, so good? Okay. Um, a couple things about the measurements here, just since they're so specific, we'll get into it. 12,000 furlongs or 12,000 stadia is roughly 1,308 miles. It's a lot of miles, just so you're clear. That's, a, that's about here to, um, so it's a little bit short, it's just a little bit longer than here to Denver. Um, Denver's about 1,100 miles. So um, I imagine it's a pretty fast angel measuring this because that's a lot of you know it's not like picking up the stick and then walking to the next bar okay never mind uh one stadia is 607 feet okay just so we have that idea uh in other words such dimensions are completely unfathomable in other words this is why they're probably symbolic because this is just remarkably large i mean this is and it's a cube he's measuring here so if it's cube of uh, 1,308 miles. How high up into heaven does that go? Into the sky? Very high! How, does anyone know how far the moon is? About a quarter of a million, probably. A quarter of a million miles. 250,000 miles away, the moon? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a lot of miles. Yeah. Um, so that's a, not a good example. Because um, <laughs> this is a little less than that. Still, it's pretty big. 1,308 miles is pretty big. Uh, if this were literal, then this would mean that this city would be shooting up into the sky and uh, it's just a very bizarre kind of thing to picture. That's, I think, beside the point here. And house in space. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think what it means is that it's going to be all-encompassing in its perfection and splendor because the number it does not use is 1,300 miles. It uses 12,000 stadia. And 12 and 1,000 are rather significant numbers, Right? What does 1,000 represent? What do we say? Total. Total, completeness, fullness, right? And what does 12 represent? 
churches? Yeah, that's right. People of God number. It's, it's a church, the people of God. So uh, the dwelling for all the people of God is full and complete, and everybody will be there, something like that. <clears throat> the new city will dominate the new heavens and the new earth like a great diamond on a ring. Uh, the cube here symbolizes perfection. It's worth noting this, that in the measurement of the holies of holies, uh, the holy of holies in the Old Testament, that room where God is and only God could be and the high priest could only enter there in the temple, that was designed as a cube. It was cube-shaped. So that uh, where God was on the mercy seat, um, that's the basic idea here is everybody's going to be in there. Everybody will be welcome in. You're not going to have to have a sacrifice to get in anymore. Why? It's already been made. Yeah, the lamb dwells in the city. Yeah. Uh, the one who is always the crucified one is there. The sacrifice that grants you access to the Father uh, sits there on his throne alongside the Father. No more separation. There's no separation. That's exactly right. And the, uh, the temple, uh, the curtain, torn in two. Right. Here's the fulfillment of that. And there wasn't, and there isn't separate sections of the temple here where certain people... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. We talked about it earlier, right? right? That there's not sectioning off who's in and who's out. You're either... An unbeliever cast into the fire, or you're here. Right. Yeah, that's right. It's Very like, good. This is this is all of God's presence here, one cube, and everybody is in there with Him. Is in His presence. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, yeah, very good, very good. The measure of man equals the measure of angels here. Um, it, it, let's see, it says the man's measurement by which the angel was using is what your translation said. Does anyone else have a different translation that says something a little different? Probably not. Man's measurement. Yeah, I, I think one of the other measurements can be. What did yours say, Jeff? Uh, what verse? Um, I don't know. Seventeen. Seventeen. Uh, it says he he also measured his wall one hundred forty four cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. Okay, I so I think that is a better translation, literally, though the meaning of what Dave says I think is a little more helpful. Does that make sense? So in other words, it literally says a man's measurement, which is an angel's measurement, but I think that's, that's that becomes awfully cryptic, and we're all trying to figure out, well, what does that mean? And I think it's just saying he's using human human numbers. According, mine says according to the human standard used by the angel. Yes, that's, I think that's the best way of understanding it. There's so nothing too bizarre or cryptic going on there. It's just saying you know how much this is. It's human measurement, okay? Um, I'm sure symbolic of something, but who cares at this point? All right, uh, 144 cubits. Now, we've run into the number 144 before as well. Where was that number? 12 times 12, the Old Testament tribes times. That's right, and we actually, if you take it by 1,000, it's the 144,000, right? And what did we say the 144,000 represented? Does anyone remember? Old and New Testament. No, not exactly. That the church, the, the church, people of God, yeah, the church, what church body that was saved? No, church no. militant, no. church no. militant, no. the church at war. Because the 144,000 is the one when you have the 12 tribes listed 12,000, 12,000, 12,000, and they're the same ones who show up when the church is on earth. Okay, so what this means, perhaps, then is this number 144 reminds us this 12 by 12 which is the people of God, Old and New Testament, which is right, but not, you know, that's not the one for uh, The point is, it suggests all God's people will be there. All right, so it's 144 cubits thick. That means all God's people will be there, something like that. How am I getting this? By reading a commentary. Okay. <laughs> Sardis and glass and gold. Uh, this is like the throne in chapter 4, verse 3. This is the same kind of imagery that's used there, which means the city is where God sits. That's his dwelling. I mean, this, this is just, basically what we're doing here, guys, is one million different ways of showing you that the people of God are fully in the presence of God. I mean, that's, that's the big idea. We will be with God. He will be our God. We will be his people, and there will be no more fear, no more wrath, no more sin, no more condemnation. Everything will be right and good. Um, the foundations are the jewels. Now, that is, again, this is some very interesting stuff, I think. In the Old Testament, where do we get a list of 12 jewels? Does anyone remember? Yeah, it was on the, the, 
breastplate. The breastplate, the yeah. ephod. The ephod. Yeah, the yeah. So the great high priest, when he would go into the Holy of Holies to make the sacrifice, he would wear an ephod. And on that ephod were 12 jewels, each jewel representing one of the tribes of Israel. Thus he's going in on behalf of the people of God, on behalf of the 12 tribes to offer up his sacrifices. Does this make sense so far? So now, if in this city, uh, the walls are decorated with these stones, the idea is, again, all the people of God are now in the Holy of Holies. Everybody is represented, every representative, did, they're there. Uh, they are part of this. I'm ready for a vacation. Um, <laughs> Another just another signification of no separation. Correct. Another and the and presence and the people of God being present with God. Then you have pearls on the gates. Um, great value, pearls of great price. There's not a whole lot of significance in this. I mean, the only other place you really get pearls in the Bible is Jesus' parable um, when he finds the pearl. Uh, it's like a what did they say? It's like a um, a man who finds a pearl of great price in a field and he goes out and he purchases the whole field so he can have that pearl, something like this. Um, a lot of times we interpret that parable to mean, so Jesus is your pearl, sacrifice everything for him. I think the parable actually means the opposite. Jesus values you and he sacrificed everything for you. And if we want to stretch a little bit here, which why not, it's Revelation, uh, and say that parable maybe in John's mind when he's writing this and that's what he's seeing, then this is just yet another example of the people of God being present um, uh, in, in the kingdom. Because you are the pearl of great price that Jesus has purchased. Something like that. And so now you pearls are in his presence. Okay? Okay. Finally, a glassy golden street. Every footstep here will follow upon and reflect the royal glory of God. That's basically what we see here. So, so a lot of the imagery and pictures we get of heaven kind of come from this. This is where a lot of our, our imagery comes from, our popular imagery. Uh, but to focus in on the imagery is to miss the point, which is to, I don't know if we said this yet, uh, the people of God present with God. And did we mention that yet? God dwelling with his people? I think I said it once or twice. Uh, that's the whole point here. Okay. Um, getting back to that Eden pre-fall or as the theologians say, the pre-lapsarian uh, position of God being uh, with his people, walking with them in the cool of the day, and there's nothing but blessing. Nothing but blessing. Interesting stuff. Okay? Okay, very good. Any questions at this point? So, will heaven literally look like this? <clears throat> I don't see why not. But it's beside the point. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's trying to teach us something else. Go ahead, Art. Will we be, will we all be free of our sinful nature? Yes. Yes, we will. How will that be taken out of our... Nature? Because, and this is, this is where it's, um, it's, because we have died and risen again. So the way Paul describes it is, um, the body that dies is sown in corruption, sin, all that kind of stuff. And it's raised in incorruption. That is, the, the resurrected life is one that is free from sin because we've been renewed. And in fact, we will say as Christians, that renewal was already granted to you in baptism. We just don't see it yet. Uh, and when we rise on the last day, we will finally see what sinless existence looks like. But to try and wrap our minds around that right now, it's not feasible. It's not possible. Because we cannot... I mean, we, we do this, right? Even when we think about heaven... We'll say things like, yeah, but I want to make sure I have a nice crown so my crown isn't worse than someone else's crown. And am I going to be, like, having more glory in heaven than someone else? I mean, we, we just can't even think of an existence where those aren't concepts, those aren't realities. And so part of this is, is a helpful reminder that we just don't understand this yet. We just don't get uh, exactly what it will be. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 says this. Uh, let me go there because I think this is actually a very helpful passage. So this is interesting as we're going there. Uh, so all temptation will be gone. Gone. Won't even be... This is what it means when it says the sea is removed. There's no potential for temptation to arise again. So this is what's happened in the last five chapters, uh, four chapters, since 17. It's been the systematic removal of everything that stands opposed to Christ. 
So first you have the beast removed. Then you had the, the, the harlot, the false teacher removed. Then you had the dragon removed. Then you had death and hell removed. All of this is associated with sin. Now what was done with sin? It was washed away in the blood of Christ on the cross. So it won't come back anymore. So there won't be temptation to sin because there will be nothing to tempt. So it's the true renewal of the mind, spirit, and body. Yes, correct. I mean, you're, you, your brain won't even go too well. He has a better crown than I do. No, no. Yeah, exactly you know, right. I mean, that's sure. part of the evil, right? Yeah, you'll simply be looking at Jesus right. and happy to do it. Yeah. You know, um, you'll simply, love will be perfected in a way that it's not understood now. Yeah. Uh, which brings us to 1 Corinthians 13. What was interesting is Joey, for Jim's funeral yesterday, this was the text she wanted to have read. And people always want this for, for weddings. I actually think it's a better funeral text, now that I think about it. Because uh, he's actually leading up to a whole conversation on the resurrection, and this is what he says at the end of the text. You know, love is patient, love is kind, um, on and on. But then he says this, Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. That's not just a nice bumper sticker to say, you know, you should be a little more polite to people around you. But the idea there is we're going to be raised into an existence of love beyond anything we could possibly grasp. So now we know in part what it means to be forgiven. We know in part what it means to be told by God you are righteous and holy, but we don't fully know it because we don't experience it. We don't see it with our eyes. We only hear it with our ears. Then we will fully know what this means. Does that make sense? Um, I like that imagery. You see through a glass dimly right now. We get glimpses of it. Glimpses of it. We get ideas of it, but we don't fully grasp it, and we won't until we've risen from the dead and things are actually made right. Um, so, kind of an interesting concept there. Good question. Very good question. Dave, did you have something? No. Okay. <laughs> Very unconvincing answer, but I'm going to take it. Moving on. Uh, sure. <laughs> can somebody read 22 through 27, please? Let's finish the chapter here. I can. Thanks. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. The glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. And on no day will, on no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no light, no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. There are, that verse 27, nothing impure will enter it. It's just not even access. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, No temple in the city. Now, after everything we've just said, why would there be no temple in the city? The city is the... Yeah, the city is the dwelling place of God. So there's no need to have a home for God. This is where God dwells. Okay, same thing. Again, if this massive cube represents the Holy of Holies and the saints are the city, then the people of God are now in direct relation to God. He's not hidden. God the Father and the Lord Jesus are now the temple. I mean, that's actually a really fascinating concept to think about. Because what takes place in the temple? God is present and a sacrifice is made. Well, here you have the Father and the Son, who is the sacrifice, eternally there. It is significant that that he is always described as the Lamb. Even here, in the resurrection state, Jesus is still described as the one which was sacrificed. Very interesting. So what what are the implications then? How long does Jesus' sacrifice... how, uh, How long... Uh, how can I word this? Forever. It's almost like don't. Yeah, it's forever. Thank yeah. you. What's that? You can't forget. No, you can't you forget. Not be there without him. That's no. right. So glory always goes to Christ for the sacrifice, not just because he led us into heaven, but always because of the sacrifice. This is very interesting. When, when um, the women come to the tomb in Mark's gospel looking for Jesus, they say to the the angel says to them, "Why are you looking for the living among the dead? You're looking for Jesus." 
the one who was crucified and will always remain the crucified one. Now, they don't translate it that way because it's very awkward. But the to call Jesus the crucified one is a perfect tense verb. Perfect tense means it's something that happened and it remains in that state forever. Right? So, like, we could say, the Raiders... You're coming to look for the obnoxious football team. They are at one time obnoxious and will always remain the obnoxious football team, right? That's just what they are. Uh, my grammar's not quite right there. We get the idea. But Jesus is the one who was crucified. It's part, it's a perfect participle. Who was crucified and remains the crucified one. Will always be the sacrifice for the sins of the world and will be worshipped as such, even on into eternity. Because, yeah, apart from that, we're not in here. See, But no, no sacrifices need to be made anymore. Why? Because the Lamb is in the presence of the God forever. And so when the Bible says in like Romans, oh, I forget where, no, Hebrews, that Christ lives ever to intercede for us, this is what it means. Up until the resurrection, and even there after the resurrection, um, we're not having our sins forgiven anymore, but we recognize that it's because of the sacrifice that we're there. Okay. Um... There's no need for the sun or the moon. Again, it's kind of like the sea. This is not to say there will be no heavenly bodies or anything like that, that the new heavens and the new earth will be without stars. But it is to say that in the new Jerusalem, the glory of God will illuminate the whole city. Uh, This is depicting the splendor which radiates from God, not a sort of change in the heavens. Really, quite frankly, this says nothing about whether or not there will be a moon. It just doesn't doesn't bring it up. It's It's saying that it's unnecessary. Yeah, there's no purpose for it. Right, exactly. Oh, it is the light. That's right. So he, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, exactly. I got nothing else there. Um, But this is where it becomes interesting. Like, it's describing a specific city. Like, in the city, there's no night. In the New Jerusalem, in the presence of God, there is no darkness, there is no night. If we want to do anything symbolic with this, throughout the scriptures, night is the time sin takes place. Right? I mean, that's, you know, that's, Darkness, night, bad stuff. It's interesting, though. It says, "For the glory of God gives it light, and the light shines through the Lamb, because the Lamb is its lamp." Go on. So, the glory of God is the actual true light shining through Christ. Yes, the Lamb, the sacrifice Lamb. Yes, He is the Lamb. Yeah, the, very the good. Light shines through. Is what's really saying there, right? Yep, exactly right. Yep. So only, again, only because of the Lamb do we actually get the light mm-hmm. through Him. Otherwise, we would still so have sin and darkness. And yeah, right. You think of it like the, the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Um, on the Mount of Transfiguration, there's Moses and Elijah and Jesus, and Jesus is the one emanating the light. There He is in His glory. And Peter and James and John are there. And then God shows up. He comes down in a cloud. And this is terrifying to Peter, James, and John. The only reason they can stay there is because they stand in the light of Christ. The only reason they're able to be there is because they are in Christ's light. And so it's the same thing here. The only reason we're going to be in there is because we are in the light of Christ. We are, we are with him. He is with us and he is for us. Yeah, very good. Very good. Um, let's see. Uh, then all the nations of the earth will walk by and bring their splendor into it. Uh, What we have here probably is the glorified saints and those kings who did not bow to the devil basking in the glory of Christ uh, while they live in the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, These are the guys, because I mean, you know, we kind of went after a lot of politicians and kings and all these kinds of things. Not all of them are bad. There are some Christian kings throughout the history of the world. Um, So perhaps it's describing them. But notice what they're doing. They're not walking in on a parade of their own glory. They're laying down their crowns. And they're coming to bring glory to God. Think of the wise men. Hmm? This is a good picture here. This is like the wise men with Jesus. They come to give the best of what they have to Christ. Their gold, their frankincense, and their myrrh uh, at his birth. This is a big glorified, that's a preview of this here. So, And they can only add to what's already great and glorious that's there, existing already because of God. Yeah, correct, correct. It's not like they walk in and God says, well, 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 this is quite a gift. Like, yeah, that's their yeah. gifts that they're giving like back. Me. Yeah, right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, let's see. Uh, gonna, gonna, gonna do... Gates are never closed here. 
because there is no night. Now, why would you close gates at night? Protection. Protection. Which means, if we're not going to close the gates at night, one, there's no night, and two, there's nothing, nothing, no fear. Need nothing to protect you. Yep, yeah, exactly right. Nothing to be protected from. Uh, from, yeah. Yeah, very good. Uh, this does not mean, and let's be careful here, that once you leave, you're out in the hostile wilderness again. It means that there's no hostile wilderness. Now, you can come and go in and out of the city, but it doesn't mean like you go back to a place of danger or something like that. Uh, not at all. Uh, this is just to say uh, there's no night, and it's just going to be a great, wonderful place. Um, no unclean thing is going to be there. Nothing separating us from the love of God. Uh, anything like that. Um, let's see. Anything else here? Again, and this is all just stuff we've kind of re we're re revisiting here, but all that is shameful and deceitful, anyone whose name is not written in the book of life, they have already been judged and cast out, and just, there's no access there for them. Uh, but you and I, whose names have been written in the book of life, have complete access to God. Okay. Make sense? Good. I think this, this book may have been more fun if we had this stuff at the beginning. This is the fun stuff, and now it's just becoming a little monotonous, but... Um, interesting. It sounds like a movie where you should read the last chapter or two. <laughs> yeah. Go back and explain why. <laughs> Look at what's being promised to you. Right. You're going to make it through. That's where you're going, right? Now let me tell you how you got there. <laughs> and again, the whole goal here... Yeah, that's right. This is how you got there. Yeah, that's very good. The, goal, the whole goal here is to say you will be with God. I mean, this is the great hope always, right? I mean, this is the Emmanuel promise uh, of, of Christmas. God with us. Being in the presence of God. Free from sin. Free from evil. Free from attacks. Uh, free to live. It's very good. So, all right, you guys. Any questions or comments at this point? Okay, we have one chapter left. 21 verses. Thanks for listening to this Bible study presentation from Faith Lutheran Church in Moorpark, California. We hope this has helped you grow in your Christian faith and study of the Bible. For more information, visit us on the web at faithmoorpark.com. Music by Kevin McLeod.